Our speaker today is Dr. Georges Benjamin. He is known as one of the mo nation's most influential physician leaders because he speaks passionately and eloquently about the health issues having the most impact on our nation today. From his firsthand experience as a physician, he knows what happens when preventive care is not available and when the healthy choice is not the easy choice. As executive director of APHA since 2002, he is leading the association's push to make America the healthiest nation in one generation. He came to APHA from his position as secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Benjamin became secretary of health in Maryland in April 1999 following four years as its Deputy Secretary for Public Health Services. As Secretary, Dr. Benjamin oversaw the expansion and improvement of the state's Medicaid program. Dr. Benjamin is a graduate of the Illinois Institute of Technology and the University and the College of Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine and master of the American College of Physicians a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, and a fellow emeritus of the American College of Emergency Physicians. He holds honorary fellowships in two British societies, the Royal Society of Public Health and the Faculty of Public Health, as well as an honorary, honorary doctor of science from the Meharry Medical College and an honorary doctor of public health from the University of Pittsburgh School of Health. An established administrator, author, and orator, Dr. Benjamin started his medical career in 1981 in Tacoma, Washington, where he managed a 72,000 patient visit ambulatory care service as chief of the acute illness clinic at Madigan Army Medical Center and was an attending physician within the Department of Emergency Medicine. A few years later, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he served as Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Thank you for your service. After leaving the Army, he chaired the Department of Community Health and Ambulatory Care at the District of Columbia General Hospital. He was promoted to Acting Commissioner for Public Health for the District of Columbia and later directed one of the busiest ambulance services in the nation as Interim Director of the Emergency Ambulance Bureau at the District of Columbia Fire Department. At APHA, Dr. Benjamin serves as publisher of the nonprofit's monthly publication, The Nation's Health, and the American Journal of Public Health, the profession's premier scientific publication. He is the author of more than 200 scientific articles and book chapters. Dr. Benjamin was named the 50 most influential clinical executives in 2022 and amongst the 100 most influential people in healthcare from 2007 through 2018 and including 2022 by Modern Healthcare Magazine. Dr. Benjamin is a former member of the National Infrastructure Advisory Council a council that advised the president on how best to assure the security of the nation's critical infrastructure. As you can see, Dr. Benjamin has influenced just about every branch of medicine there is for the public good. So on behalf of the Chautauqua Women's Club, the entire Chautauqua community, Dr. Benjamin, we are honored to have you with us. Let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Dr. Georges Benjamin. Well, Kelly, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to spend some time with you today. And, and, and George and Cressy, thank you very much for um, um, recommending that I come up here. Um, let me just start that, um, you know, I like to tell stories. So I'm going to start with one. And, you know, the usual way stories start right, is once upon a time, um, there were these two health care providers down by the river. And, you know, um, they're, they have their lunch there every day. Um, you know, I enjoy having lunch. It's a beautiful river. It's quiet. It's peaceful. And, of course, um, 
while they're there that particular day, they hear someone crying for help. Um, and they see a battered and bruised person you know, floating down the river. And they dive in, pull that person out, stabilize them, and take them up the hill to the, um, to the hospital. And small community hospital up the hill there. And, um, and as the story goes, of course, the next day they're having lunch, and this day there are four people floating down the river, and they do the same thing. They go in and get them down and patch them up, take them up to the hospital, and you, you can see where this story is going to go. The next day there are six people, and then 10 people, then 20 people, then 30 people. And of course, if you're going to have that many people battered and bruised floating down the river, you really need to build um, a system to take care of them. So you you know, do all kinds of really neat things. You um, train people in pre-hospital care. So you get EMTs and paramedics. And of course, you want to move them very quickly from the side of the river to the hospital. So you um, design ambulances. First, kind of small, and then kind of large. Kind of large because you can start providing care very early uh, in the care. And particularly for some of these folks who are pretty seriously injured floating down the river. Um, and you know, of course, not only do you want to make a very robust pre-hospital care system, but in order to take care of all these people floating down the river, you've got to have a really robust ER. So this small community hospital goes out to the philanthropic community and gets some funding and embellishes a big emergency department to receive those very battered and bruised patients coming into the hospital. And of course, some of them are really, really sick. And really, really sick people need a very specialized place to take care of them. So you build an intensive care unit. And as an ER doc, I, early in my career, I practiced emergency medicine. I love the bells and whistles and the trauma. I'm an adrenaline jockey. So I really can relate to this. And you, you, know, you take care of people in this critical care unit. And you know, we got you know, very, very good at um, taking care of these folks. And, um, who were very battered, bruised, broken, and saving their lives, people who would have normally died um, because the medical care that you've provided has been so extraordinary. Um, but, you know, at some point, um, while you're pulling people out of the river, somebody asked that most important question. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, who's throwing all those people in the river? So what do they do? They go up the river. And they look up, and there's a cliff, and there's a crooked road, and a broken guardrail. And of course, people are zipping around this crooked road, hitting the side of the mountain, going over the cliff, and of course, that's why all the people are going in the river. So they put up a speed limit side, do some really good sound public education. They enforce the speed limit on the, on the road. Um, they fix the guardrail and bring the end to their um, river emergency. That's what prevention is all about, is doing simple stuff. Um, and as a nation, we really haven't done that very well. Um, you know, we in our country spend over $4 trillion, almost 20% of a gross domestic product on health. And you would think spending $4 trillion, we would get the best outcomes. Turns out we don't. Um, depending on who's measuring, we're somewhere around 45 or 46 when compared to other nations. Um, and industrialized nations, we're at the bottom. And that does not mean that we take away from the extraordinary efforts that we do in healthcare. I mean, we are really good at putting people back together. We are really good at um, treating people with um, acute care diseases and chronic diseases. But on a population basis, when you look at what we do, we just aren't as good as um, many of the other nations in the world. So interestingly enough, the Commonwealth Fund, who does this kind of ranking um, every year, um, has looked at how we rank with other nations. And they've tried to explain why that um, change is. And they, they have this ranking that they look at five domains, access to care, the process in which we provide that care, administrative efficiency, equity, and healthcare outcomes. And in doing that, again, we show up at the bottom of that. And 
there are really four core reasons why we have what was, in essence, um, a mediocre performance. And I might add, um, we pay almost twice as much as many of the other industrialized nations. So Norway, which is at the top of their scale, um, they pay about $7,000 per capita per person for care. In the United States, almost $13,000. So we pay almost twice as much and get, um, don't get the best outcomes. Um, but they really look at four areas. The first one, of course, is a lack of universality. Every other industrialized nation of the world has a system with everyone in and nobody out. Now, single payer is only one way to get there. There are many other ways to get to universality. Actually, the Affordable Care Act, if fully implemented the way it was designed, um, with the exception of undocumented um, immigrants, would literally get us to universal coverage if those 10 states um, that have not expanded the Medicaid program did so. Now, there are some other things we have to do to, to give people good care. Um, in many ways, we still have an enormous number of people uninsured and a growing number of people who are uninsured, underinsured in the country that we still need to address. But nonetheless, the first reason that we're different from the other nations is, is the fact that we don't have universality. Second one, there's a strong in, um, inadequate investment in primary care. As I mentioned, I'm an emergency physician, and I, um, I absolutely love the bells and whistles. I miss clinical medicine each and every day, but uh, I got to tell you that in the emergency department, emergency department, the president of the ER does not give you universal access to health care. If you tragically crash your automobile or you fall off a ladder, there are many things we can do to help you. But if you have a little bit of elevated blood sugar, a little bit of elevated um, blood pressure, the emergency department doesn't fix that. I don't care how many times you show up in the emergency department. I cannot fix chronic diseases from the emergency department, even if I try. And, you know, there are many people who are under, underinsured or uninsured who show up in emergency departments on a regular basis um, in order to try to get that care, and it's very clear the system just does not work that way. The continuity of care is not there. The quality of care, even though we would love to think it's good quality care, just isn't there. We need to have a much more important emphasis on fundamental primary care services. That means the systems that work real well, everybody has a health care provider that they know is their doctor or nurse practitioner but they view them as their primary care provider. And we, have, we don't do that. Um, we love to build the, the centers with bells and whistles. We don't love to invest in the places where people have good primary care. And there are some exemplars out there of good primary care um, in the rest of the world. Uh, Cuba, by the way, being one of them. So we need to invest in good primary care systems more so than anything. By the way, we only spend about 3% of our health care dollar um, on um, public health. A little bit more if you add all the other research and a little bit more if you add prevention to that health care dollar uh, as well. The administrative complexity of our system, the fact that we have so many pieces that are fractionated, that don't talk to one another, right? You go to the hospital, you get care, you're about to get discharged from the hospital, and they hand you a prescription. When there's a pharmacy in the building that could theoretically hand you your medications, so now you have to leave the hospital, still not feeling very well, drive through the pharmacy to get your medicines before you go home. And we've designed the system that way. There's some reasons of fraud and abuse of why they've done that, but it really is not designed to provide care for the patients. It's designed for the system. The fact that we have all these pieces that don't talk to one another. Um, you know, during COVID, tragically, the experience that we all just went through, um, we still had health departments in this country filling out papers by pen and ink and using this thing called a fax machine. I guess looking around the room, most of us know what that is, but my kids don't, to send information. And yet, every single one of us probably has one of these amazing devices. And we can send information, text, documents, data, 
to each other all the time, and yet the healthcare system can't send the EKG across the street because we've not really invested. The technology is there. We just haven't invested in that system in uh, any kind of meaningful way. Um, and then what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about is this investment in the social systems that either help you become healthy or impede you um, from being healthy. Now, I like to use the World Health Organization's definition of health, um, which is defined as being the, ste the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease um, or, or illness. And, and for simplicity's sake, Let's focus for a minute on one factor uh, of health that I think is pretty um, illustrative of our problem, life expectancy. So we pay more, as I mentioned, to have shorter lives than, than the other nations. Um, and I think the real challenge we have here is just how far um, um, we are from you know, providing good, adequate care. You know, in the state of New York, there's like a 35-year difference in life expectancy from the lowest counties to the, the highest counties. And that's a phenomenal difference. I live in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Um, I usually show this map of the, um, of the city. Uh, and every train stop, you lose life going out to the suburbs from the city. Um, I'm always glad to say I live out where I'm gonna be about 80 years of age, so I have an idea of how badly I can, I can eat and enjoy myself, because I know how long I'm gonna live. Um, it's crazy, it's crazy. It's, it's, and we know that place matters. Place absolutely matters. Your zip code in many cases is more important than your genetic code um, in many of our systems. And it's just because we have not paid attention to those kinds of social determinants um, of health that we have, and we know that at least recently, COVID was a significant cause of this decline. We lost about two and a half years of life expectancy as a society um, in um, various populations. Uh, about a year for all people, about two and a half years for African Americans and Hispanics um, during COVID. It wasn't just COVID, it was also it was all causes, so it included um, um, other diseases as well. Um, yes, yeah, suicide was a part of that, drug, drug misuse was a part of that. Um, but the point is that, and all nations, by the way, had some loss of life expectancy uh, from COVID. It was a terrible, terrible uh, pandemic. But the U.S. fared the worst. Again, the nation with probably the best economy in the world um, fared the worst as part of that process. And by the way, we still have an obesity epidemic, an opioid epidemic, a firearm violence epidemic. Um, we now have the return of neonatal syphilis um, in our community on a, on a a growing basis because we have a growing um, epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and the real tragedy is, is that, of course, um, most of those diseases um, can either be prevented or certainly significantly mitigated um, as we go forward. And we continue to underinvest uh, in mental health or absolutely don't treat it with parity as we do um, with physical health. And that remains a big problem. You know, we have some bright lights. One bright light is that you know, I, I started my public health career in the early days of the epidemic of HIV AIDS. And now HIV AIDS has become a chronic disease and we may for once and for all have the ability to really stop significantly the transmission of HIV AIDS uh, in our nation because of some of the therapies we have. Um, we also have the promise of curing hepatitis C um, with effective therapies, although the pharmaceutical cost of treating hepatitis C is um, phenomenal. Uh, and that continues to be a barrier. And of course, if you've been reading the newspapers lately, you see that at least one House of Congress is looking to substantially cut the funding from public health six months after a global epidemic. So, you know, we still have like 27 million people without health insurance coverage. Uh, two out of five working adults are still underinsured. Uh, I mentioned the 10 states that um, have yet to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, even when the federal government is going to pay almost 100% of the cost. That sounds to me like an ideological decision and not necessarily a financial decision. And we know that costs continue to be on the rise. That's one of the biggest concerns that we have right now 
uh, of health care. And of course, what, to cover those costs, what we're now doing is shifting those costs to folks, to people with um, co-payments um, in order to try to control the premiums uh, as part of that problem. Um, and of course, this patchwork we have uh, of systems creates overuse, underuse, uh, and just enormous inefficiencies in our system. By the way, um, if no one didn't give you the little secret during COVID, we actually had a single payer system to provide care for COVID during the pandemic. I'm gonna tell you another little secret. We all didn't become socialists. The world did not come to an end and the economy is still booming for most of us. Still some of us not. It wasn't because of COVID. So I think the thing we need to think about, and now, by the way, we're going back to the regular way we deliver care and the fractured system to now provide services for COVID. Um, you know, and we're still having these debates again about who's going to be able to afford their vaccine and who, who are not going to be able to afford it. The good news is the federal government is going to have a program for the uninsured for COVID, but it is time limited. And so we do need to fix that as we go forward. You know, I, I um, think that in order to do many of the things we need to do, we have certainly serious work to do. So obviously we need to figure out um, how to get this universal health care system in place. We need to come up with a, a way to have a good um, health IT information highway. You know, we don't even have a single patient identifier. So we don't know if George Benjamin in data system A is the same George Benjamin in data system B. Part of the problem we have with COVID with sorting out people. You know, turns out there are lots of John Browns in the world and Mary Jones is in the world. And um, sometimes they live in the same neighborhood, sometimes on the same block. And yet, Amazon doesn't have a problem figuring out who you are. <laughs> in fact, not only do they have not a problem figuring out who you are, but they have no problem figuring out what to, you know, promote to you, <laughs> you know? And all you have to do is buy something once and they got you, they know exactly what to do. Uh, and yet in the healthcare system, we have not yet figured out um, how to use that kind of science in an effective way, maintaining patient confidentiality, of course, um, how to identify patients at high risk and ensure that they get the kinds of services they need, sure they get the health information that they need, et cetera. The tools and the knowledge is there, we're just not yet using them. So one of the painful revelations I had as an ER doc was that 80% of what makes you healthy occurs um, outside the doctor's office. And that was, by the way, a very, very, very painful uh, revelation to me. It was painful and um, in some ways enjoyable at the same time because I, I figured out that there were some things I could do um, in public health that I couldn't do in emergency department. And, you know, if you come into an emergency department with a rat bite, you can take care of the rat bite. In fact, you can evaluate it, make sure it's not a terrible injury, you can clean it very effectively, and you can really put a really beautiful dressing on it. But if 10 people come in the emergency department with rat bites, you're not doing any good unless you get rid of the rats. And by the way, the solution to getting rid of the rats, I know we're all thinking exterminators, but the solution to getting rid of the rats is getting rid of the garbage. You can get rid of, kill all the rats you want, but if you don't get rid of the garbage, the rats are going to come back. The rats come back, the bites come back. So you really have to think of health in a very, very broad way if we're really serious about solving this problem. By the way, other nations have done this. They figured this out. They have made strong investments in the kinds of things that do that. So as we think about this whole issue around zip code, zip code and being very important, place being matter, you know, place matters because, and your zip code matters because it tells, controls, high quality access to schools or jobs or healthy housing, access to nutritious foods, all those kinds of things um, are important um, if you're really trying to, to improve people's health. And by the way, these kinds of differences are not hidden in America. Uh, I know all, you, you're from all over the country, but every single one of you in your community has a, a road. And you know where that road is. Some places it's called uh, Martin Luther King Drive, Sometimes, sometimes it's called Main Street. Sometimes it's named after some very famous person from the community. 
Um, it's almost always a um, railroad track that defines these neighborhoods where you look one way and you see enormous prosperity and you look the other way and you see terrible um, um, tragedies in terms of prosperity. And sometimes you see enormous, almost always, differences in life expectancy from one side of the street to the other. And in many ways, those were designed. They were designed many years ago um, through redlining policies that created those kinds of communities to do that. We know that health is about infrastructure. You know, we've had several bridge collapses. Those folks in, in Pittsburgh had a terrible bridge collapse fairly recently. Um, we've had infrastructure failures uh, around the country, the failure to invest in that. The good news is that we now have money that's going around the country to help us rebuild that infrastructure. The question is, are we gonna rebuild things the same way or are we gonna rebuild that infrastructure in a way that thinks about health at the front end of the construction um, or the repairs that we're doing? You know, we um, have like a nine degree difference. You know, we're all worried about heat right now. A nine degree difference um, in lower income communities than more prosperous communities in terms of heat. And that's because we have, in those communities that are poor, we have less green space. We tar over the roads when we finally get to fixing the roads. Um, we usually dark impervious surfaces that don't handle rainwater well, so you get a lot of flooding. Uh, and yet, there are solutions. They're called smart surfaces. We can do that. We can put lighter roofs on the roofs when we rebuild those houses. We can design communities so that we can get rid of that nine degree difference gradient. Not only does it impact the health of those communities, particularly because those lower income communities have a higher incidence of heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease. Uh, but in addition to that, um, they tend to have more violence in those communities. And certainly we know that the hotter it gets, the more violence we have. So there are things we can do to structure our communities a whole lot better. Um, we know the health is about access to clean water. Um, Flint and Jackson, Mississippi, were not just infrastructure failures. There were also um, um, political failures from a political determinist perspective. You know? And they're preventable. And by the way, all of our central cities, all the cities that were built many, many years ago that have old lead line pipes, now we're in the process of trying to change those lead line pipes to get rid of them. But when I was a health um, officer in Maryland, I was always fascinated um, when we gentrified communities and more well-to-do people moved in those communities and their kids were now being exposed to lead um, in those older homes. And the good news is that those, those families were able to afford um, to remediate those homes. Um, the lower income individuals usually were not. Um, so that became a problem. But access to water, and water is becoming, because of climate change, a really hot commodity. As you know, we're having water debates and water wars all around the country here, and of course, they're gonna become water wars all around the world uh, because of the lack of access to clean water. And we need to pay a lot more attention to that. Poor air quality. Um, I was talking to the health commissioner in New York City a few weeks ago and um, doing the um, um, wildfire burns from Canada uh, that of course came up to the Northeast um, and they had to get all involved in poor air quality. Um, and climate change is an issue, but the fact that we're still burning fossil fuels um, with abundance uh, creates real challenges for us. And so we still have challenges with poor air quality. You know, um, where we dump our trash. So when I was uh, at the health department in DC, um, who's, been, who's been to Washington DC? All right, so you all know what I'm talking about. You come across the 14th Street Bridge from Virginia into DC, beautiful view. You know, the Washington Monument, Jackson Memorial, the White House right there, as you're coming across the 14th Street Bridge. But in the middle of the night, what comes across the 14th Street Bridge are the illegal trash haulers. And they come across the bridge, and even though there are vacant lots in the more processed part of town in Georgetown, for some reason they don't turn left to go into that neighborhood to do illegal dumping. They turn right and go into Ward 7 and 8, um, and the, then the, the, more, the poorer parts of town and dump their trash. And one of 
public health interventions at that time was to put police officers on the bridge to stop them, ticket them, or turn them around. Um, and we have lots of places where people are just mindlessly throwing trash around. We're not, we're not taking care of those communities. And of course, a lot of that stuff, depending on what's in it, goes into the groundwater, contaminates the groundwater, a whole range of stuff. But we can fix this. Uh, it brings down property values, et cetera. And again, not paying attention to details here. This whole issue of food deserts. So everybody has this vision of food deserts as being a place where there's absolutely no food. We don't really have food deserts in the United States. What we have are places with little small community stores, right? They're about a room and a half. They um, make their margins selling tobacco, um, sometimes liquor, and there is no, they don't sell um, salads, but they sell high salt, high fat, low nutritious foods. And the challenge with those places are, um, I call them chips and dips places. And when you've been working two shifts and you're tired and you're on your way home and you just want to get something to eat, they're quite convenient for the person with a little bit of heart disease, a little bit of diabetes, a little bit of high blood pressure. So all the dietitians in the world aren't going to solve that problem of someone who's hungry at 3 o'clock in the morning after having worked two shifts when what's in their community um, uh, is a challenge. When I was a health officer in D.C., there, was, there were no grocery stores east of the river in Washington, D.C. They've solved that problem finally. Um, but just getting business in those communities um, can be a challenge. By the way, we know you can do it. We, we know we can make money um, on um, communities. Communities, it turns out that lower-income individuals will buy fresh fruits and vegetables and consume them in large numbers. There are two criteria, however. They have to be affordable and they have to be fresh. Makes sense to me. Uh, and yet, we've not invested from an economic development perspective uh, in that. The quality of housing. Um, you know, we, we all know that everyone would love to live in a beautiful home with um, a swimming pool in the backyard and, you know, beautiful green space and all that kind of stuff. Um, but tragically, too many of our, our citizens are living in trailer parks. Um, nothing wrong with living in a trailer park, um, but some of those trailer parks um, um, have um, broken playground equipment and stuff in the backyard, and they're dangerous for a whole range of both physical threats, environmental threats, um, and people are challenged because that's all they can afford. And then in the inner city, uh, you have all the boarded housing that we continue to um, not invest in. And then we wonder why those communities aren't doing well, um, why people are hopeless and helpless in those communities. And it turns out if you um, fix up those communities, um, all kinds of things, good things happen in terms of reducing crime, reducing violence, and improving health. You know, education is absolutely a health determinant. We know that high school graduates have better outcomes than non-graduates. Uh, one of the interesting statistics is that babies that are born to mothers who do not finish high school are nearly twice as likely, the babies are nearly twice as likely to die before their first birthday than mothers that finish college. And that has been shown in every society that has looked at maternal, the correlation between maternal child health, no matter where they are. Education correlates with child survival. Education correlates with child survival. And whether that's a surrogate for income or class or whatever, I'm not sure I understand it completely, um, but it's true. We know that this school to prison pipeline we've created is a real challenge. Um, it's disproportionately impacting communities of color, but it's real. Uh, the fact that we now have um, um, the presence of more guns um, than we have people in our country and concentrated in less and less hands um, and an increasing movement to you know, write rules that quite frankly don't make any sense. Um, in terms of who should have a firearm and who shouldn't. 
we, we have things we can do from a societal perspective to, chart, to solve these issues. Um, and then income inequality remains a big role. There's no question there's a strong correlation between wealth and health. And then the elephant in the room, of course, is this whole issue of income, uh, is, is whole issue of racism, discrimination, and xenophobia. Um, let me just be real clear. Um, racism is still alive and well in America. Um, very few of us get up every morning and think we're racist. But a lot of us carry all kinds of biases. You know, we're human beings, we have biases. Some of them we were taught. So I remember I was taught as a medical student that premenopausal women didn't get heart attacks. Leading cause of death in women, you know, of, um, for that. Yeah, we thought, you know, there was science that thought that if you were premenopausal, you were, had a protective effect and didn't get heart attacks. So when, how did that mean? When a woman came in with chest pain, that wasn't the first top of the differential diagnosis. She could have a little bit of high blood pressure, a little bit of diabetes, a little bit overweight, still wasn't at the top of the differential diagnosis until you got that EKG, stumbled on that EKG, and saw, oh my God, this person's having a heart attack. But if you were a male, we always did it. EKG, first thing that happened when you walked in the door. Now, we've learned that that's not true, and you know, we've begun to teach our, our students differently. You know, we still have medical students who think that African Americans have thicker skin than whites and have less, acquire less pain and treat them because they think African Americans have less pain for the same conditions. The same ones that took anatomy and saw how thin the skin is or how thick the skin is. People aren't connecting the dots. And again, biases in the system. We, one of the reasons we have that people don't want to trust the health system is not how they were treated several years ago with Tuskegee, but it was how they were treated yesterday as part of the system. So I, I think it's clear that, that um, to achieve optimal health, we need to achieve social solidarity um, as part of this process. And other nations have done this. Um, they've invested a lot. They spent a lot more money on social services and those kinds of things. Um, they have universal educational systems and universal um, retirement systems. Um, they invest a lot more um, in infrastructure in their nations than we do. Um, we pay, but we pay on the sick care side uh, of the equation. Now, you know, a social compact is an implicit agreement among members of the society to cooperate for the social benefits. Um, it does mean that some people get more or some people get less in concept, but I would like to think of it as that some people get what they need when they need it. And if you do it right, then everybody gets what they need when they need it to nobody else's disadvantage. And so I've been arguing for some time that we need to step back and maybe the next phase of health reform is for us to sit back and rethink um, uh, our social society, try to work very hard to build a social cohesion so that people um, value everybody um, doing this, that um, next time we have a pandemic, people will actually wear their mask and get vaccinated and recognize that it's not just that they're just protecting themselves, but they're also protecting uh, everybody else. Now, I know it won't be easy um, to do this. Um, you know, I have no doubt um, to do this. And uh, I just encourage each of you, each and all of you, that when you try to help us achieve this social solidarity, is help us build a grassroots advocacy movement to advocate for it. Uh, one that's led at the grassroots by local leaders that can build trust uh, through personal bonds. One that helps people understand the lived experiences of others uh, as part of that process. Um, that engages our next generation. The next generation is very socially conscious. We need to corral that energy and focus it um, for, the so for societal good. Um, and engage the business community part of this because there's an economic value um, and having this social cohesion, and really work to change the hearts and minds of the, of the, the vast middle of our society. We're going to have to be persistent and ferocious in this effort um, because 
the policy environment in which I work in today is extremely hostile. And, you know, I've always believed that the goal in life is to have to live as long as you can, as well as you can, and have a short but glorious ending. And to think about in order to do that, um, we need to build a society that values everyone equally um, to move ourselves forward. So I really want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you today and ramble on about everything other than health care. And I look forward to uh, taking questions. We'll go back and forth, and you'll start on the side, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you addressed uh, Europe and uh, how much better their health is there. Uh, how much has to do with lifestyle? Uh, they are much more preventive-oriented. They're much more um, healthy in terms of their diet, their exercise, and so forth versus us. How, how much does that play into the, our problems here? Yeah, the, the, the question is lifestyle, and it plays a role. But as I've been around here for the last couple of days, there's a, a whole lot of people walking and riding bikes and, 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 and doing that. And, you know, as a society, we, we do that. But it, it, it's still there is a – we've not created an environment in which it's easy for others to do that. So if you're in a low-income community in an urban setting, um, for safety reasons, you may not be able to ride your bike. You may not be able to walk. You may not be able to walk at night because they have not replaced the light bulbs on your street. You may not be able to walk because there's no sidewalks when they design your community or the sidewalks are broken. So, yeah, um, we can do that, but we have to make it easier for folks to do it. Uh, that was a great talk, and thank you very much for, uh, for presenting what you did, and you touched on many facets of the problems that we face in public health. My question is about access to care and accessing care. So I'm a glaucoma specialist. 50% of the people who, ha who are in the community, uh, sorry, let me start again. 50% of the people with glaucoma don't know that they have it. Yeah. And uh, that's because of uh, both a lack of access to care and a lack of accessing care. And if we do a screening for glaucoma, for instance, um, about 30% of the people who we identify who have a disease will actually follow up for care. And the number who follow up after that is even lower. Yep. Um, and so my question, because this is another facet of what you talked about, is how do we get people to come in for care, to seek care, and to seek follow-up care? Yeah, you know, and you know, one of the things is I don't know all the reasons why in that particular situation people are not following up because they've been screened, they've been told that they have a, a particular health problem and they can't make it there. I can tell you in the areas in which I do know, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, um, it's the, the health, they don't have a health care provider. They've been screened, but they don't necessarily have a health care provider. They don't have um, services that are available when they can get there, you know, their Monday through Friday day services are not weekends, holiday services, um, or they can't get there. So during COVID, we try to resolve all those problems. Remember, we, had, we paid for Uber to take people to um, um, get their medications, to get vaccinated. Um, we fixed a system to do it. Someone had to pay for it. Um, and so um, I think in two ways, some of it is maybe a lack of understanding of what the seriousness of you know, the, the disease is. Um, but I, I think we could easily construct a system to get all those folks in. Um, so once you screen them, we know who they are, and we work very hard to get them in. You know, we have a, a health system that if you don't show up, okay, you don't show up. Nobody follows up. Thank you. Right. Dr. Benjamin, I just want to, first of all, before I ask my question, thank you for your service to the nation, both at Madigan and the soldiers and their families at Walter Reed. Thank you. My question is given the shortfalls that we can now identify prior to COVID, how would you go about fixing the shortfalls before the next pandemic? Yeah. 
So I think the first thing is the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services has to be viewed as the, the nation's chief health strategist. Um, and, the, and the nation really needs to sit down. And first thing we need to do is have Congress, um, well, it would be nice if Congress would authorize this, but you know, we've been advocating for a commission, to, like the 9-11 Commission, to actually ask us, find out what really happened, to really put it on paper and then come up with some fixes. We have a lot of a sense of what went wrong, but there's a lot of myths out there, and there are a lot of things that we think happened that we don't you know, really know what happened. So I think the first thing we need to do is do a, a, a COVID commission that will get to the facts and then um, dutifully you know, fix those things. One thing. Second thing we need to do is once and for all build a comprehensive, robust public health system in the country. We don't have one. We really don't. Um, we um, have a very underfunded public health system. We've been underfunding it for years. Um, we lost about 40 percent of the public health, the governmental public health workforce during COVID, and no real plan to bring, you know, get them back. There's money. Um, there was money from the ARPA funds that were appropriated to, and they've been doled out to the states, but the states don't have a blueprint on what to do with it. Um, and, and they're struggling. I mean, they'll get there, but um, a lot of it's one-time money. And, you know, if we did that kind of one-time, what I call yo-yo funding, something bad happens, we throw a lot of money at it, and then just before we really get it fixed, we start withdrawing the money. And by the way, that's exactly what Congress is doing today. They don't want to talk about COVID, um, except to you know, find things to blame. And they're, they're cutting the funding. We actually have um, people in Congress who are trying to take apart the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So those would be the first two things I would do. And, and, and obviously, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a Herculean effort, but I do think we can do it. Um, and by the way, we need to do it in a way that just isn't U.S. centric because the bugs don't, don't honor, you know, um, borders at all. And so it needs to be global in nature. That help you? Hi, Dr. Benjamin. I'm from Maryland, so I know you've done a lot of work in our state. I want to thank you for uh, talking about how people are trying to get primary care in emergency rooms. One, uh, our press in Maryland is talking over and over again how hospitals are selling their emergency rooms to head fund, hedge funds and financial investment firms. Uh, what, what, talk about that. What is going to be the effect of having for-profit companies running our emergency rooms? Yeah, well, they're not, they're not only running the emergency departments, but they're now running um, a whole range of hospitals and other systems. You know, I, so I, I, think, I think, you know, we always want, I enjoy, I'm happy to have private investment in anything um, to help fund things. But, you know, the problem with the way those dollars are invested is that everyone's trying to get a quick return on the dollar, right? And all it's going to do is drive up costs because what happens is you, you buy the systems, you squeeze out every dollar that you can, um, and you um, remove physician autonomy for on the physician side of it. Um, and the people don't necessarily get the, the best system because the motivation is money. It isn't patient care. So I, I, think, I think that's the first thing we need to do is, is, is address that. Now, Maryland's, of course, a little different on the hospital side. For those of you who may not know, Maryland regulates hospitals as a, like a public utility. Um, and they've been doing that for years. It actually works quite well. Uh, so if you're Medicaid or Medicare or Blue Cross Blue Shield, the hospital gets the same amount of money for your appendectomy no matter where you are, which insurance you have. So there actually is no uncompensated care in the acute care hospital system in Maryland um, because it's covered under the all-payer system. Um, the problem is, is that the investment that are coming from outside may very well um, undermine that system to some degree mm -hmm. uh, at a time when I'm encouraging Maryland to bring everybody under that all-payer system. In mm -hmm. fact, if I could wave a magic wand and I was chief health strategist for about 25 minutes, um, I would um, basically make our healthcare system, Medicare, uh, kind of a Medicare for all advantage system under an all-payer system. 
I understand there are Medicare advantages issues with the payment and people concerned about that, but that gets fixed by an all payer system mm -hmm. um, under that. And that'd bring everybody under it and, and that would, I think, solve part of the problem. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, with one in six of our kids today having a diagnosis of some kind, I work with families of these kids, asthma, allergies, ADHD, autism. We're breaking the bank at the schools and in the healthcare systems. I loved your story about fixing the barrier for, so people aren't falling into the water. What is the equivalent of this for our children? How can we educate families on the importance of diet and movement and exercise and sleep and the basics of life instead of eating chips and dips. Yeah, and you can see I'm a, I'm a guy who's had a, who has had a challenge with my weight, would weight most of my adult life at least. Um, I think uh, the gentleman who asked me about um, um, the lifestyle part of this, you know, I've always argued the, the place to start is with our kids. And we, if I, again, could, focus our investments, I would start with kids. You know, universal um, preschool, um, universal daycare, um, health education in school, um, including even in Florida. Um, <laughs> you know, um, putting physical activity back in the schools, investing in music and art programs in schools, you know, investing in the culture of our kids very early on with the ultimate goal of um, um, improvements in society. And you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic is very important, but it's hard to do that when you're struggling to pay attention in class or when you're hungry. And so doing those fundamental things uh, make a big difference, and, I, and I, that's where I would start. Thank you. Yes, you spoke of the importance of the zip code that even can be over-dominant of genetic code. It, maybe it was my interpretation that zip code was relating mostly to urban zip codes and redlining and so forth. Can you address the rural zip codes and the amount of investment and health issues that yeah. might be happening in those zip codes. I, I hope I didn't give everyone that impression. Let me just tell you, so I, 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 I have a slide, so you don't understand I'm doing this talk without a PowerPoint. This is, this is revolutionary for a doc to give a talk without PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, and I actually have a wonderful picture of West Virginia. And I use this because West Virginia is 97% white and very rural. And um, I show these two counties um, in West Virginia where there's a two-year life difference in life expectancy between these two counties. Um, and it's thought to be fundamentally all about the resources in those two counties. So the answer is, it ain't all about urban folks. It's, it really is about zip code. And it really is about the resources of where you are and how people use those resources and what they invest in. And we have some pretty regressive rules. I mean, the fact that we have property tax tied to um, school investments. You know, we probably ought to relook at that, okay? Because it seems to be regressive in, in a lot of ways. So it's, rural communities have the same problem. Um, it's not about race. It's, it's really about resources. Thank you for doing such an amazing job on all the social determinants of health and, and the barriers there. I wanted to um, ask you, is, the, is there a lack of primary care physicians that people are not um, y using primary care in the community and using the ERs? And this has been going on forever. When I worked back at a city clinic 40 years ago as a nurse, um, people were coming into the ERs for their primary care. Is, this, is, is it true that there are the same number of medical student spots now in American medical schools as there were decades ago? Do we need more medical student spots? And, and what, how can we incent those medical students when they're graduated to go into primary care and not the specialties of, you know, doing cardiac 
procedures and all insert, you know, all the, the, the things that reimburse higher. I, I know that, that there is prediction of a shortage of physicians um, for a variety of reasons. The retirement of the baby boomers, um, the fact that we really haven't grown enough residency slots for um, spots. But, you know, the corrosive part of the fact is we pay, um, and, and pardon to my folks in specialist, specialties that, you know, do procedures and make lots of money, um, but the fact that when you have a, a two to three percent different, not percent, um, times, two to three times difference in what you pay for primary care versus passing procedures for sub sub specialists, then people are going to um, um, go to those specialties that not only they have an interest in, but also where they're going to get a better return for the investment that they made going to school. Um, and so, you know, one solution is to pay primary care physicians more for sure. Um, secondly, find ways to invest in them to you know, cover their medical school costs, maybe more, more um, loan repayment programs, et cetera, but investing in primary care. Uh, and then building systems so that um, your primary care provider can be there um, in that practice, in a robust practice, and actually make a living. And increasingly, it's becoming a real problem in rural communities. Not only are we having closure of rural hospitals, but the primary care systems are falling apart in our rural communities. And we're going to wake up one morning, um, and they're just, you know, we're going to have significant problems um, that, that need to be addressed. Hi there. My question's about the corporate determinants of health. And when you look at precision medicine, which has gotten billions of dollars of investment in the last decade or so, how do you contrast that to the preventative medicine or precision public health and what's the biggest gap that's preventing funding from going towards precision public health rather than yeah. precision medicine? You know, it's funny. We, we just don't invest in prevention. You know, we love, you know, first of all, it's, it's hard to, um, um, to avoid an acute care problem because they're right there in front of you. They're bleeding, they're injured, et cetera. You kind of got to take care of them. Um, but prevention, we just... Um, kind of like everything else, it's kind of like home maintenance, you want to put it off. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a determined effort to invest in prevention. Again, I mentioned only about 3% of our healthcare dollar goes to the public health side of the equation. Um, and until we're serious about that, um, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, we've got to decide with intention to build a system that keeps people out of the river and, and healthy and well and we've got to stop saying that we want them to pick them up from their food steps. They need to exercise more, and they need to, um, um, you know, eat a healthier lifestyle. Now, don't hear me wrong. We should continue to say that. But we need to recognize that we've put enormous structural barriers in the way that make it difficult to do that. Um, and for pennies on the dollar, we can have the idealized system that, that, that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Ruth. Before I get to my question, I have to thank you so much for being here and talking to us about such an important thing. We've had wonderful speakers about so many things. I've learned so much. But to be here and have someone speak for Medicare for All is heartwarming to me. So thank you. And because you can reach so many people in all the states, and we got to get the word out to everybody. I, one person, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, and I've been on the Medicare for All committee now for a lot of years. We've gotten the, uh, both houses, the representatives, the senators, to approve of Medicare for All in our state, and yet it has never gotten to the governor's bench yet. Gottfried has been wonderful, a wonderful leader. He's retired now. Um, my question to you is, right now, there is a problem with advertisements giving you Medicare whatever, benefits. Med Medicare Advantage. But they're benefits. fighting Medicare. How do we, how can I tell them in an, in an 
easy way that they will understand it, how these new companies are really in competition with the government's Medicare for All. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the challenge we have is um, we need to really, first of all, most people don't know what Medicare is. I mean, you know, it, we, we really need to step back and make sure people understand what Medicare is. They need to know what traditional Medicare is. They need to understand Medicare Advantage. Um, and they need to understand when they're signing up for Medicare HMO. We, we need to do a much better job um, getting people's health literacy. Uh, and we need to start earlier um, in the process, uh, educating um, adults in particular uh, about that. Um, we also need to make sure we do a better job educating um, legislators and policymakers. They don't know what it is either. Uh, and um, unless they're involved with the health committees and have really delved into it, um, they really don't have a, a real sense of the potential uh, that it has. Um, and we've got to work with the uh, various trade associations so that they understand that we could craft a American version of a universal plan for everybody, um, again, without, and they will all make money. They will make money, because oh, yeah. this is America. We they all do, do very well. We're they will do very well. We're the low, third from the lowest country in the world with providing health care to our poorest people and our youngest children, and it is such a crime. Yeah. I mean, it's... Well, it's a shame, and the, the real challenge is the 20% of administrative costs that we spend in health. Um, um, even, even the system we have now, if we, we could simplify it and reduce, the, reduce that wastage, basically, um, I think we would do better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna say we have questions here, but that'll be it, thank you. I'm from Ohio, and uh, the first speaker also was talking about your lifestyle. Um, I lived in England uh, in my 20s, and what I found out there, that they take care of you from cradle to grave, no matter what's your status. And I remember going to see my doctor, and I had to, in my 20s, there was nothing wrong with me. But my doctor would talk to me, there wasn't time limits either, about what I ate, how much I exercised. I mean, this is every six months, and other private questions. Yeah. And I think that is why people there are more healthy than they are here. So then I came to this country and I find out that there is a lot of propaganda by big pharma and insurance companies. And uh, I think they are brainwashing people to believe that they have the best care in this country better than anywhere else in the world. And most of my friends believe in that 100%. And I don't believe that's the truth because they haven't lived anywhere else and they haven't seen anything else. They haven't experienced it. So that's my comments. Thank you. Yeah, the, you know, the 15 minute visit, the 15 minute robust visit where you're supposed to examine the patient, um, um, provide uh, an understanding of what's going on with them, and then um, advise them on how to improve their health, uh, not enough time. Um, and, and by the way, that's the, the end, you know, that's a big part of that 15 minute visit. Just not enough time um, in the visit to do that. Yeah, and then they're on the computer. Um, the patient in the back's to you and they're on the computer, um, you know, dictating their note. It's a problem. Yes, sir. In the 2000s, I was involved in a project that um, wanted to look at FQHC expansion in an area that was completely underserved. And to our surprise, we found out that the greatest opportunity for funding in that era was really in the Bush administration, where it met a political ethic to deliver health care at a local level. And the most difficult era to get funding was the Clinton administration, 
where we were looking for large universal fixes and all the funding was frozen as we tried to move through that process. Can you say a word about the political pragmatism of using FQHCs as a principal delivery system for primary care in this country? Yeah, I'm a strong proponent of, of community health centers. Um, they do amazing work and they provide a more comprehensive care for a lot of the patients because they've built systems of care for complicated patients with complicated lives. Um, and, um, um, and challenges. And so I support them, and it is true, we've seen a great deal of investment um, um, in community health centers. Um, you know, they, but it's often been as a alternative to universality. So I would argue we need both. Uh, we need to actually have a payment system that makes sense, a delivery system that makes sense, and then we need to make sure we have access to care in all the communities. So it isn't one or the other, it's both. And yeah, there's been some, um, depending on who the president is and who's in Congress on certain years, we've been able to get more in one area and less in others. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm also from Maryland. Um, I think we all remember a time when um, drugs were not advertised on television. And it, real, it just recently came to my attention that that's an enormous part of the health care costs. Is that something that we as individuals should be lobbying our legislators? And is there any chance that we'll ever get drug commercials off of TV? Yeah, I wish, we, I wish, I, I wish the drug manufacturers would stop advertising on TV. I'm, I'm so tired of hearing about rare diseases that, that um, you know, um, you notice they're not, they're not advertising um, a lot of hypertension meds or diabetes meds or the things that are the 10 leading causes of death. Um, you're not seeing a lot of the pharmaceuticals advertised for that. Um, and you're right, what they used to have is a, a detailed person would go in every physician's office and, and talk with them about pharmaceuticals, et cetera, and then they realized by doing a broad population advertisement, they could um, drive up sales and certainly drive up demands for those drugs. So I would love to see them go away. Thank you along with um, tobacco and a few other things. <laughs> George. Yeah, early in the summer, we spent um, a couple weeks in Norway and Finland studying comparative healthcare policy and practices, and that's a bigger topic than this question. But the health minister of fin Finland really stopped us in our tracks. He said, why do Americans love guns more than kids? Why do Americans allow 11,000 young children to be killed by guns under 16. Why do you kill 50,000 of your citizens? I and mean, by the way, Japan kills less than 12. When is gun violence going to be recognized as a public health crisis? When is Congress going to give you the authority and the money to educate and make the case? Because in the zip codes that are having all the other health care problems, one in five blacks is likely to die of gun violence. Yeah, George, you're right. Um, so first of all, there is a public health approach to gun violence. We know exactly what we need to do. Um, we can make firearms safer. You know, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is not allowed to regulate guns. They can regulate teddy bears and cars and the, um, you know, hair dryers, but they can't regulate um, firearms. Um, but we can make firearms safer. I mean, you can pick up a firearm right now, you don't know whether it's loaded or not. Um, load indicators, and a whole range of things that can be done to make firearms themselves safer. Secondly, we make people safer with their firearms, um, for sure. And the third thing we can do is make the environment safer for people and firearms together. That, that public health approach was described in the early 90s. Uh, it's a roadmap to success. It's the same roadmap that brought down automobile crashes and death and disability from automobile crashes. And so there is a way to do it. Um, we got to get the political will. It's all about political will. Universal background checks to make sure that the right people um, who could have firearms have them licensing, red flag laws, a whole range of things, the interventions we know from an evidence basis in the United States and other countries works, and we need to do it. And the issue is we do need to begin to value our kids more than we value our guns. Thank you. Final question. Thank you. Um, I'm old enough to remember when it was determined that smoking cigarettes would kill you, and then the laws were passed to not have those 
advertisements on television anymore, to not be advertised to your children anymore, or in magazines and things like that. And so understanding that high fru fructose corn, corn syrup and saturated fats and all that stuff that's in all the foods that's creating you know, the gastro neuro diseases that ultimately kill us and make our children know. Is there anyone or any way that that kind of path can go? Because if there's not a prescription drug advertisement, there's a Burger King one. So just wonder what your thoughts are. About I, I think the difference between tobacco and, and, and foods um, is that tobacco has no redeeming value whatsoever. Um, and foods, granted, some foods are healthier than others. Some are much more healthier than others. Um, although, you need to understand, I believe that pizza is a vegetable. Um, <laughs> all right, cheese pizza. Um, but honestly, I, I think that's the, that's the fundamental difference. But nonetheless, we could invest in more in education. And again, starting early in school, putting back health education in school, putting physical activity back in school, um, helping kids make better food choices by being better educated about those food choices. Um, and creating a society where those food choices um, um, are more likely to be, you know, the healthy salads, et cetera. Um, but we designed a system that's, you know, that, by the way, I was on sabbatical in New York City a few years ago at Hunter College. And of course, um, um, you know, I was forced to eat healthy because they were just nice, healthy options um, south of about 110th Street. The minute I got up by the School of Public Health, um, and that's where the fast food place is still. So if you go look in your communities, we've designed our communities for exactly um, access to um, the unhealthier foods. And I know from personal experience, sugar is very addicting, so why would I want to eat broccoli when I can have sugar instead? Without sugar on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you all for coming to our SIF programs all summer long. Have a great off season. And